Welcome to my channel. I have been thinking about doing this for seven years. Seven years and I am tired of thinking about it. I don't know why I feel the need to do this channel, honestly, because it's completely out of my realm of comfort. I am an introvert. I'm here to talk about books primarily, but what you'll also see on this channel are a little bit of maybe a bit piano growth. That's gonna be fun. And the other thing that I will do on this channel is be talking about maybe um, health stuff, maybe. I've got loads of allergies. I don't know anybody else like me and I'm not really being, I'm really being serious when I say that. I'm allergic to a lot of food, anaphylactic allergies. I've um, had a couple of near-death experiences and maybe I will talk about that at some point. I've actually come through a lot of it and found a way to live more comfortably. Anyway, that's just a good idea of what I'm gonna be talking about. And cats, I love cats. As you can see, I have. <laughs> so you'll see cats as well, if anybody loves cats. I love videos with cats in. I don't think I even would care about the person. If they've got cats in their video, I'm all about it. So, and then if you like cats, then maybe you'll like it. Also, the channel name, The Lunar Key. I also love spiritual things. I'm really interested in kind of evolving consciously. I mean, within my mind, I love to dabble in all different types of theories, even if it's really ridiculous to some people, like, oh, you're crazy. I'm just like, I'm just playing around with this idea. I'm like trying it on like an outfit and then maybe I'll keep it on or maybe I'll just let it go because it's not working for me. That's kind of how I am. I like to read a lot of books on a lot of different topics. I do read a lot of non-fiction, but I do read fiction as well and kind of spiritual things. At the moment, I'm reading a book on feng shui and it's really interesting because there's a lot of things on feng shui that I tend to do intuitively and it talks about in this book and I thought that was really interesting because... I feel, I like to feel energy. Yeah, so these are the kind of, sort of topics that you'll see me talking about. But anyway, to start off this very first video, I'm gonna be talking about this book, which is perfect. And it's called, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. It's very appropriate. I'll read the little thing on the back, the summary. And another thing as well, I see in a lot of these um, channels, a lot of people use literary terms to describe books. I have no experience in English literature at all. I read books purely for joy. Terms such as prose and all the rest of it, I just, you're gonna find me being really generic. I'm not gonna be using any fancy terms. Maybe I'll learn them, I don't know. But I'm just, pretty much what you see is what you get. I'm just gonna give you a good idea of what I feel about a book, tell you what it's about, and then maybe you wanna read it too, I don't know. This work here, The Shallows, has become a foundational book in one of the most important debates of our time. As we enjoy the internet's bounties, we are sacrificing our ability to read and think deeply. This 10th anniversary edition includes a new afterword that brings the story up to date with a deep e examination of the cognitive and behavioral effects of smartphones and social media. The author, Nicholas Carr. So he actually wrote this book in 2010. And I'd, how did I come across this book? I don't remember how I come across it. Yeah, it actually, the book is really appropriate for the times we're in. It's very actually prophetic. The fact that he writes this in 2010, considering where we are now, technology and how it's really taken over our life. He really delves into the brain. I love the science involved in this book in the sense that he actually understands neuron patterns and how it can affect our minds by actually, I don't, I, I'm ill prepared to read, talk about this book if I'm being completely honest with you. Let's just have a look, but I wrote loads of notes on it. Let's just see what I wrote on this book, okay. Talks about removing and actually the patterns in your brain. You can create pathways in your brain and the brain naturally continues into those pathways unless you actively break out of those pathways. And I think that's fascinating and it makes sense. So like habits, unless you consciously break a habit, your brain will automatically want to go into that pathway to create that habit. 
and with the internet it's very addictive i really feel like it's so addictive because it is addictive i have a problem with the internet actually i've got i've done a really good job of removing certain things from my life that i feel like i've had a hold on me whether it be sugar or just alcohol i quit drinking alcohol 10 years ago i just hate anything having a hold on me the internet is probably the last thing in a sense that has got some sort of you know I don't know, I have to really, I have to actively make an effort to read. I only allow myself to be online for a certain amount of time, but I don't have a TV. So internet is like a form of TV, like television for me. I like to research all different types of things. I love researching. The thing is, you know, like I actually read these books a couple of weeks ago and because I've been stalling on doing this whole thing, I, uh, I've forgotten what it's about. It's really good though. <laughs> <laughs> this is Tootsie Roll. This is my cat Tootsie. So let's have a look here. Yeah, it's the same as depression. So if, you're, you're, if your mind is actually stuck in a, a certain pathway, unless you try to, so if the person's depressed and they find it really difficult to go to the gym or walk or do, they have to do, they have to make that one conscious effort to get up and break that pattern. And even though it's really hard to do, once you start kind of breaking the old habit and creating new pathways, then you can shift that energy. And so that's essentially what he's talking about with the internet. But I just read this book yesterday, I could give you more detail, I'm sorry. But you know, well, this is what I'm gonna be like. I'm gonna be honest. This, I'm probably gonna be like this. So you have a good idea of what I'm gonna be about. I'm very rambly and I go off on tangents. Oh yeah, my name is Tori, by the way. Just so you know that. Um, if we stop exercising the brain, the brain doesn't forget. It uses the brain map space for something else, maybe a negative habit. Plus, you know what? That's so true, right? I have an obsessive mind, and if I don't have something to obsess about, my brain will find something for me to obsess about. So I have to have positive things to focus on. It's like my brain gets bored, or I just get bored. And there's a quote here which I liked. The source of consciousness lies beyond the grasp of consciousness. And I really like that, because it makes me think about how we're all trying to understand what God is or what the universe is really about, when really, how can we really understand what the infinite is? The universe is just so infinite and large that it's actually ridiculous to even think for a second that we have an idea of what the universe is. And I think we're just trying to work it out, right? I was thinking the other day how everything is a microcosm of the macrocosm. So if you ever see a pictures of the galaxy and then you see like how the brain works with all of the, the synapses and the neurons firing, it looks like a picture of the galaxy. You've got everything being a miniature version of a larger version. It's almost like that Russian doll thing. I really think it's like dum, 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 dum. everything is just forever swallowing up itself. That's got nothing to do with this book. I don't know why I said that. Quote, though what we do and how we do it moment by moment, moment, day by day, consciously or unconsciously, we alter the chemical flows in our synapses and change our brains. For example, using, our, um, using maps on the phone has weakened my intuitive abilities with remembering locations based purely on recall. Total lack of direction. <laughs> compared to when I was young. When I was young, I'd have such a, an ability to just be able to go somewhere and know exactly where I was going, I had really good directional skills. And now, because ever since I've been using Google, Google Maps, relying on that technology, I have lost the ability to retain that type of information. I never learned to drive when we had physical maps. I was kind of, for my generation, I was a little bit of a late person learning to drive, but I grew up with people using maps, you know? It definitely is better for your brain. You have to exercise your brain as opposed to having this technology just telling us what to do here you go i'm just going to feed you the information and i think that's what's going on with tv and i find that i can't watch a lot of tv as in just regular television shows i have like a couple of things that i would like to watch if i watch too much of any sort of tv where i'm not using my mind to think i really feel such a big difference in how i function it almost makes critical thinking way slower if i did a lot of like just say I went through a phase of watching a ton of movies and then I, I needed to do something where I was exercising my mind, play chess or learn a piano or just read something that I had to really put some mind into and understand it kind of like what I'm doing now. TV, because you're just in this, out, I think it's an alpha state, your brain changes its 
um, frequency. So you've got frequencies that the brain can clock in and out of. And the actual t television, the way us sitting there watching TV, puts us into a sort of alpha state. I think it's alpha, where you're calm and sort of docile. And I have to double check that. And it's like beta is stress, when you're really stressed out. And then you have that brain, that brain frequency when you are in meditation. I don't meditate, but I've had this happen. Do you know when you're just about to fall to fall asleep, nod off, but you're still awake? I don't know if anybody else experiences this, but that's when I kind of get weird spiritual experiences happen. They pop in and I can talk about stuff like that in a different video. Being in this alpha state, watching the television, it kind of, this is how marketing and advertising does a good job because even though you don't think that you're taking in this information subconsciously, this stuff gets implanted in the brain. Anyway, this book really gets into how technology is just essentially making us dumb. So I think there's a place for it. Certainly there is. If I didn't have the internet, then I wouldn't be doing this video, would I? I mean, it would be just silly. So I can't be like, oh, I don't like the internet and then sit here and do this. But the internet is a problem. <laughs> is a problem so what am i talking about here i'm talking about but let's have a look thoughts on language reading oh my gosh the other thing about this book right it actually gets into the language he referenced a book that i bought after this and it's called prost the Pro proust the squid and the proust or the proust and the squid it's one of those and it's about the origins of the lang of language and it really gets back, I think, to like Mesopotamia and these kind of, these old times where language came from like Phoenicians, like phonetic alphabet and how it started off with symbols. So this is my very first video and it's going to be really awkward. And you know what? I just have to put it up because I'm never going to do this. I won't do it otherwise. So this is going to be actually probably really annoying for anybody that watches it, but it'll get better. So let's have a look here. I always write notes because I think it's nice to annotate because when you, if you look back in future and you look back on your notes, it's just so different to how you think in that moment. You know, you realize how you thought back then. So it's almost, it's a type of journal in a way a little bit too so yeah he talks about socrates and how socrates was actually very much against writing and reading and it's how it's interesting how that plays now you've got a lot of people that fight against new technology i think partly out of fear or partly out of losing what we have in this current moment and just losing ourselves but look how many people love to read and and write and when this book was written in 2010 i imagine because he was talking about the fear of people using e-readers and, and no longer using books but the interesting thing is youtube is actually helped people to read more. I've always loved physical books and I've, I've got my first nook. I got a nook in 2014 and it just didn't beat reading. But now I found a really healthy place in using both. Like I take my e-reader to the gym. There'll be times where it's appropriate to use an e-reader, but hardly, like at nighttime in bed. I don't like like using a lamp. It's very subtle lighting because my brain is really sensitive to lights and stuff. During the day and the evening, I love uh, with the, in the front room. I love reading physical books because it's it's a three-dimensional energy, right? You can't beat it. It has an essence to it. The, the books have an essence as opposed to technology. It's a tool, but I think that, you know, Socrates and people around that time were actually looking at speaking and reading as being a very odd thing. And it's just so interesting how all these new things that come along and they're just so odd and they've become so regular to us. I can't imagine reading and writing just seem almost part of of nature to me. There is something that happens to the brain when you do remove excess noise, you remove distractions you of all, all types, whether it be reading. Reading is the lesser evil than being online or watching junk TV. That is really not feeding the mind, feeding the soul, really just kind of just empty emptiness really but being in nature it's almost like our frequency as a human being our light because we all have energy right and i think we all run on different frequencies if you collaborate to different frequencies you become that frequency so if you sit in nature for a long time you can start actually getting impressions and getting different information come to you that comes from wherever it comes from you don't know where it comes from but it comes from somewhere that isn't from a book and it's not from a tv it's like from a higher place i don't know how to say it i don't know if, if you know you know, you know, you know. 
So let me just see here before I finish this because I think I've done a really crappy job of talking about this book. What did I say here when he said, looking ahead to future applications of electronics, he grew even gloomier. He believed that electron physiologists would eventually be able to monitor and analyze four of brain waves, allowing joy and grief to be measured in definite quantitative units. Ultimately, he concluded, a professor may be able to implant knowledge into the reluctant brains of his 22nd century pupils. What terrifying political possibilities may be lurking there. Let us be thankful that such things are only for pos um, posterity, not for us. This was something that this scientist was fearful of um, in the 50s. He'd have, like, he was a scientist and that was his kind of prophecy. And then I wrote this note here. iPhone. There's a video I watched, it was a conspiracy video, and it was talking about how, I don't use TikTok, but I guess on TikTok, there was the light that comes through the actual camera on the phones. If you use the right camera to pick it up, it basically puts out this big ray of different lights, and it can pick up the eye movement, pick up emotion to what you're reading and how you're feeling, and you can get adverts sent to you, and all this, depending on where your eyes are looking at your phone. So your camera is just iPhone. So everything's like Google, right? googly eyes google because they're watching everything so you know to read in physical media what's it here the difference between reading versus um physical media on a screen there is a crucial link between the sensory motor experience of the materiality of a written work and the cognitive process of the text content the shift from paper to screen doesn't just change the way we navigate a piece of writing, it also influences the degree of attention we devote to it and the depth of our immersion in it. You know what, I'm not doing a good job talking about this book, but it's a very, very good book. If you're even interested in anything like the brain, how it functions, I recommend this book. I flew through this book. I will say the last quarter was a little bit more kind of redundant to me, a little bit of a stretch, but it was still worth it. It was definitely still worth it, but that's my attention span as well, I can, I can get distracted, you know what I mean? Believes books will become obsolete. That was in 2010. They're not obsolete. I don't think books will ever become obsolete. There's too many people that love books. This is not, I don't think it's possible. It certainly won't be possible in my life. I'm gonna buy every book. I'm gonna buy every book I see. I love books. Brain differences between people who use the internet to those who hardly. Let's see what it says here. The researchers recruited 24 volunteers, a dozen experienced web surfers, and a dozen novices and scanned their brains as they performed searches on Google. Since a computer won't fit inside a MRI machine, the subjects were equipped with goggles onto which were projected images of web pages along with a small handheld touchpad to navigate the pages. The scans revealed that the brain activity of the experienced Googlers was much broader than that of the novices. In particular, the brain savvy subjects used a specific network in the left front part of the brain known as the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, while the internet naive subjects showed min minimal of any activity in this area. Which sounds like a good thing, but I also do think that's what induces ADHD. You've got such a epidemic of ADHD now that I think that it's just too much going on. So it's, it's like that thing what they, people say where a master, oh, hang on a minute, what, what is it? Master of all, no, jack of all trade, master of none sort of thing. You know what I mean? So basically, okay at some things, but just never the master of anything, really. It's just an over an overabundance of information. We have just too much access to too much information now. So there's a run of hypocrisy in every single field that it's overwhelming. If you think you've got it down, the only thing that you can possibly do in this life of information overload, I think, is go within, try things out for yourself and do what works. And what works for you might not work for somebody else, depending on what it is, whether it be food, how I eat might not work for somebody else, exercising, activities. Like some people might just really just love watching loads and loads of TV. TV and just like actually be just fine doing that. Maybe that's the way their brain works. To be everywhere is to be nowhere, I like that. So what I'm gonna do is each video, when I talk about a book, I'm also gonna leave, this video is really getting too long and I have to edit it. I'm gonna leave a, a word at the end of each video. And this, the word that stood out to me in this video is mellifluous. For all the years of reading, I never come across that word, I don't think. Mellifluous. Mellifluous? Um, it's mental illness so prominent due to the lack of silence, electronics, 
Wi-Fi, radio frequencies buzzing everywhere. Newer generations are born into this technology with no reference to the simple life outside of it. What will that create? It's really crazy to think of that, you know. So I'm an 80s baby and I have the advantage, I believe is an advantage to have experienced technology and also life without technology. As a child, we'd go outside, we played, we rode bikes, but we also had Sega Master Systems and Nintendos, but it wasn't, it wasn't, people weren't obsessed with them. You play them, but it, it wasn't unhealthy, I don't think. I don't think it was unhealthy. It was just like an extra, another toy. We all played out, played rollerblading and skateboarding. It was just people were more active. But I do wonder, these children that are being born now into these um, younger generations, they're given iPads when they're two, three years old to play on. And so, to them, they may start seeing technology is nature because they have no point of reference to see that it actually isn't. I think that's really unnerving because I think that that kind of generation may be open or suggestible to implementing technology into their bodies or becoming one with technology when we're actually just completely separate. Obviously there's different people that feel different things about that, whether they agree with microchipping and all this kind of stuff. To me, I don't think there's any room for that within the human body, personally. Anything that's foreign like that is problematic. So technologies are assisting us in removing us from nature. Invention of clock disconnected us from the natural flow of time. Yeah, so we're like relying on maps as well and losing our bearings on natural navigation, intuitively having an idea of where to go, you know? Just knowing, the inner knowing, we've lost that because of relying on these things outside of us. And I think that's part, I think that kind of thing also plays a part in anxiety, depression, people just feeling lower, but not really knowing why they feel like that. Something's wrong, but they can't work out why something's wrong. And that's the thing because we're just so far removed from our natural state. Obviously we need to rely on time to some extent because time was invented so we can meet each other at this point and just rely on these kind of things. But at the same time, it's a detriment, I think, to us. Everyone's chasing, 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 chasing something, running away from something, and it's just not in the present. This is the first book I've ever reviewed, so that was definitely messy and it will get better. I'm gonna go now. Mm. Thanks for watching. Bye.